I know how to delegate. I know how to give things to my team. The only way to make business sustainable is to make sure it does not always all rely on you. I wanted to ask you, Lena, how do you conceptualize your personal growth journey? Because I know that you kind of started the growth journey because you wanted to outgrow a really difficult situation, early teens with your mom. And that strategy of outgrowing the situation worked so well for you that you eventually built and sold three businesses for 50 million at 29. And online, there's a lot of conversations around enoughness, right? And so you could have stopped at this point, you could have uh, gotten complacent or you could have just had enough. But you were like, okay, now is the time to hit the pedal and go. What are people that don't understand your drive and your desire for growth? What are they missing? I think there's a couple of things, which is, you know, I think some of it might, might circle back to what I consider, like, what do I want to do with my life? What's the purpose of life in general? All of those things. Like, if you really go down to the root of it, I think that's where a lot of people might stand with that. You know, for me, I think from a very young age, I have always felt that the purpose of my life was to realize the best version of myself and to tap into any potential that I possibly have. And so I think from a, from a younger age, I've believed that if somebody else can do something, so can I. And that's been a belief that served me really well. You know, maybe I couldn't do it today, but if I put in the work, I get the skills, I put in the effort that I could do it. And so for me, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like I sit here and, you know, I was talking to my team about this the other day, even it's like, the money is just a byproduct of all the other things that are what business exemplifies to me. Like business has become a vehicle for my own personal growth because I think a lot of people, you know, why was I able to outgrow that situation when I was younger? I had no choice. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I had no choice, but it felt like I had no choice. Mm -hmm. And in business, when you have hundreds of people who rely on you and you employ and who follow you, you know, at some point it feels like, oh, I don't have a choice. I need to kick, I need to get better. I need to rise to the occasion. And um, I like that because I found that that's when I'm able to really tap into parts of myself that I didn't think were there. And I'm able to break, continue to break beliefs that I have about myself, I have about the world that I find out were never true. And so for me, it's always been that vehicle. And I think a lot of people hear that. They're like, that's great. But you know, I want to spend time with my family and I want to do all these other things I enjoy in life. And I think that's just your flavor of how you go about doing things. You know, I think a lot of people see how much I work and they assume, oh gosh, you probably don't have a lot of time to do other things. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that I work with my family. I'm married to my business partner. Yeah. My dad works in my company, right? My cousins, we talk about business and I have the people that work for me are my best friends. And so, you know, when people say, well, where's the work-life balance? I'm like, I have intentionally created a place where it is not just work and it's not just my life. It's all, it's all one. And so I think that a lot of it comes down to being able to engineer that environment for yourself because, you know, <laughs> it's like, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You rise to the level of your environment. And when I have an environment full of people who I care about, who I know rely on me, who I would take a bullet for, I'm going to level up when I need to. And it's not going to feel painful and hard as much as it would if I were doing it alone. And so, you know, for a lot of people, I think that are looking like, how do I do that? It's like, how do you create a system where your business makes your family better? Like, how could you involve your family in the business? How can you, you know, use the business to make your family better, use your family to make the business better? I think I always think of it as one system rather than two separate systems. It's kind of like in business, if you were to have a beauty business and then randomly you're like, you know what, I'm going to start a uh, business for, you know, manufacturing, I don't know, let's just say uh, dumbbells, right? And it's like, wow, those are both products, but they're like, they don't help each other in any way. Yeah. You selling dumbbells interferes with you selling beauty products. But if I were to say, well, I want to start selling skincare. Those two would feed each other because if you buy my skincare, you probably want my makeup. And so I take much more of a skincare makeup approach to life rather than a dumbbell yeah. makeup approach to life. And I think that's hard for people to see from the outside. 
but it's why I'm able to keep going because I really love what I do. I love who I'm doing it with and I'm happy every day. That's such a beautiful answer. And I actually have a question about integration later because I kind of had the intuition that you're really, really good at this and that that's a major key for unlocking kind of so much of your potential holistically. Before that, I would love to ask you, it's triggering for others, right? That you keep growing and at the rate that you are and they start to compare themselves with you. And I've seen so many people that get paralyzed by the comparison and it actually sabotages their growth. In your case, it's almost like the comparison with others fuels your growth. So how's your mindset different in that regard to people who are kind of struggling with comparison? And how do you operationalize using comparison as fuel mm -hmm. rather than, you know, having it as a restraint? I think it's completely normal that when you see somebody doing better than you in an area, it can be that they're in better shape than you. They have a better marriage than you. They have better business than you. They make more money than you. They seem like better mom than you. It could be anything, right? When you see that person, I think most people in the split second have a feeling of envy, right? Or feeling of like, you know, fuck that person, <laughs> whatever it is. But what happens next, we get to choose, which is, do you allow that emotion to dictate your behavior? Or do you choose to act in a way that would be productive? And so I think what happens for me is that I might in a split second feel like, dang, envy. But then I'm like, oh, that's so cool that somebody exists that can inspire me and they've already run the four minute mile. So I can learn from them how to train for it. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, what happens is instead of saying, wow, somebody ran that mile, I can learn how to train for it. They sit in a corner and they say like, why am I not there? Why am I not better? Why am I not? And I don't ever look at comparing outcomes. I look a lot of times at comparing processes. Mm -hmm. So if I want the same outcome as somebody that I'm comparing myself to, I just look at the reps, how they put in more reps than me. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, the answer is yes. They put in way more reps than me at the thing that I am envious of, right? Mm -hmm. I can do that too. That's under my control. Then it just comes down to, am I willing to make the trade-offs? Because those reps in that one area obviously take away reps from another area. You know, it's like some women, for example, you know, they might've just had two kids, right? It's like, you have two kids, like you probably don't have a six pack two months later. And they see girls online. They say, gosh, I wish I looked like that. I wish I had time to my hair, my makeup and all. But you also have two kids. And it's like, you could take the time to do that. But right now you might be choosing to spend time with your kids. And so I think a lot of times it's contextualizing it, meaning understanding that Every kind of benefit in life comes with a trade-off. Are you willing to make that trade-off so that you can be that person, right? And then the second piece to it is, you know, I think if you're like, yeah, I want to make that trade-off, use it as inspiration. Learn what they've done, you know, get close to them so that you can understand, like, how did they train to end up in that spot? What mm -hmm. was their training process? Rather than beating yourself up for not being there yet. And so I think it's really like a lot of us can be very strong on the outside, but we might actually be victims of our own minds. A mm -hmm. lot of people on the outside appear like a hero or a victor or a leader, but they beat themselves up inside. They make themselves the victim of their own mind and thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I recognized maybe six, seven years ago, I still was doing that for myself. I was still beating myself up. I was still, if I did something wrong, if I wasn't as close to somebody else as I wanted to be, I just spent all this time just hating myself for it. Honestly, like I, I can get pretty dark. And so I would just be <laughs> mad about it. Yeah. Not. And so, and then, you know, I was sitting with my friend one day, we were actually uh, at her cottage and I told her, I was like, I just feel so crappy that this happened. And she was like, okay. And so what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I'm going to do that. She's like, all right, well, you shouldn't waste so much time beating yourself up over it because all that time you're taking beating yourself up over it, you could be taking to learn and grow into doing this new thing and achieving that. And I was like, Oh shit, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> like I'm taking all of this energy and putting it into something that takes me to a dead end. Yeah. When I could be putting that energy into running for my mind. That makes so much sense. Hey, Evelyn here. I just quickly wanted to hop on to encourage you to sign up to my newsletter. When you do that, you'll not only be informed as soon as a new episode drops, but you also get access to my exclusive growth goodie bag. That is a collection of highly valuable resources provided by our guests and myself, tools, strategies, case studies, templates, and so much more that will help you to grow and monetize that growth journey. If that sounds fair, then click the link and make sure to sign up to my newsletter.
when we're not thinking about, you know, how do you, how do you decide the trade-offs that has to go hand in hand with, I have a clear version of where I want to go and who I want to be. How do you cultivate that self-image and that, you know, what is Leila in five years from now? How do I create her? Who do, who do you decide what skills do you want to have? How you want to look? Where you want to live? Right? right? What dreams to chase? If you're so capable that you, you know, might be successful in either direction you choose. Yeah. That's a good question. You know, my advice for somebody who doesn't have a vision to anchor to is to look at all the people that inspire you mm -hmm. and pick out, like, don't, you don't need to be them. There's rarely somebody that you're going to find that you're like, I want to be every piece of them. I mean, even for myself, like I think about it, I'm like, I know what pieces people will probably pick out and then they'd be like, I'll leave the rest, <laughs> right? And so I think it's looking at all the people you admire, figuring out what is it that you admire about each person and then writing that down and then thinking of like, how can I make this authentic to me? Like, in what way can I conceptualize this so it makes sense for myself? And so something that I think I've always done is I look at people and I don't have any one person who like greatly inspires me, but I have a lot of people who inspire me a little. And I can look at the things that they do, the traits that they have, and I can ask myself, what is it that I admire about them? What is it that I like about this person? What's the one trait that I think this person has that I admire so much? And then I write those things down and I think about them and I'm like, okay, well, how could I do that? And so, you know, in the very beginning, when I was first starting my entrepreneurial journey, I basically wrote out a list of all the character traits I wanted to have. And I looked at it and I rated myself at how high or how low I was in each one. And that was very helpful for me because I realized there were some areas I was really strong in, but there was also some that I was really weak in. And what that meant for me is I looked at it and I thought two things. One, I won't be able to achieve my goals unless I take these weak areas and make them strong. The second thing, one thing that was very important to me is I really wanted a partner who also had those kind of traits, mm -hmm. right? And I, had, I actually had another list with all the traits I wanted a partner. And I looked at my list and I said, well, you're not going to get that partner unless you beef up your list. Yeah. And I think that was something also as I realized, like, what kind of person do I have to be to attract other people to help me fulfill that vision of my life. You know, because I think a lot of times too, it's like we have this vision, but I don't want to end up alone. You know, a lot of it is this vision of the kind of people you want to have around, the family you want to have, the friends you want to have. And I recognized that in order to have a spouse of a certain character, friends of a certain character, a company comprised of people of certain skill and character, I had to become a 10 out of 10 in all those areas. And so that's really what drives me is like, I think for a very long time too, when I was younger, you know, I think a lot of people can relate to this. Growing up, you know, probably because of my home situation and just because I think I just felt, I wasn't like, I didn't belong in any group, right? Like I didn't have, I wasn't like, oh, the cheerleaders, oh, the track girls. Oh, I was like on my own and I kind of just like could get along with anybody, but I also didn't really fit in with anybody. And so for most of my life, I just felt alone. And so for me, a lot of it has been, well, one, I would like to not be alone. I would also not like to be with people who I feel yeah. like I don't want to be around. Like, mm -hmm. I, I am good company to myself, so I can be alone. But at the same time, I would love people to share these cool experiences with. And so I think that was a huge piece also of my vision is, what kind of person do I have to become to be able to surround myself with people who make it worth it to not be alone? Because I felt for so long in my life, like being alone was a better option than surrounding myself with these people. Because when I was around those people, I felt more alone than I was by myself. You know? You think that that's um, the underlying maybe problem people that label themselves as introverts um, have, that they don't necessarily have gotten clarity around who they need to become and to be with the people that they want to hang out with that maybe not withdraw energy from them. Yeah. You know, here's the thing. I think that labels can be useful when we're searching for a remedy for something. But I think that labels are not useful when we're looking to stick with our problems. And I think a lot of the times people think they're looking for a remedy but then they find a reason to never solve the problem in a label. And so for me, I've not found them to be more useful than not. I find them that they're less useful than they are useful. Not saying they're not useful, 
but just not as much as not using them. And so for me, when I was, especially in my 20s, even when I was a personal trainer at the gyms, you know, people were like, well, you're very introverted. I didn't like to go to the social events. I didn't like to go to the gatherings. Even with my family, like when everyone comes in for Christmas, I like go on a three hour walk. Mm -hmm. Like I just want to be by myself. And it took me years to realize that it wasn't that. It was that I had no shared interests with anybody that I was around. I did not have the same shared values. And so the things that they wanted to talk about conflicted with the things I wanted to talk about. And the things that they didn't want to talk about bored me to death. And I felt like I was being depleted of energy when I was talking to them. Mm -hmm. and so it's funny because if you were to ask me 12 years ago, would you have an office? with? I'd be like, um, no. You know, the first time someone asked me, would you want to be a manager? In fact, I haven't shared this before, but when I was a personal trainer at 24, one day they told me that they had to send me to a training. And I was like, what's the training for? They're like, it's something for like, you know, people in their first year. I don't know. They like, give me some vague explanation, but you have to be gone for the whole day. I'll stay at this place. I show up and they're like, so this isn't a training. You've been selected because we think that you're a potential leader. And I remember, Evelyn, I sat there and I was like, dude, fuck this shit. I want to manage people. You kidding me? Have to rely on them for my success? I'm so good on my own. Why would I want people? And then it was only 12 years ago. You know, and I look back at that and I think to myself, wow, I wonder how much faster I would have succeeded and excelled and honestly just found happiness if I just understood that I just wasn't around people who had the same values as I did. And now that I have this building, for example, full of people who share the same values and have really powerful missions for their own lives, one, I don't feel alone. And two, I feel energized being in this building, talking to these people rather than depleted. And so, you know, I think a lot of times we feel depleted because the people that we're speaking to, they don't share our reality and they don't share our values. And so it's this odd dance of trying to avoid conflict because you also know that you could set them off at any point because they don't like the way that you live your life. And there's nothing wrong with having different ways of doing things, but it does get tiring at times to feel like you're tiptoeing and walking on eggshells. Yeah. It feels like you have to wear a mask, right, to, or yeah. you're just being inauthentic and superficial yeah. because you actually can't go deeper. Thank you so much for sharing this. I would love to circle back to that moment when you were writing the list. I also, you know, one thing that you said that stuck with me is like people pick a partner because uh, of availability. And even in business, show me the paper where you have written down <laughs> how you made that decision I would just love to double down on that because I try to tell people all the time, you need to start writing stuff down. What's your uh, relationship to writing stuff down and how has it actually helped you to grow? I think that process, process protects us from our emotions. And so when you're making a decision in a highly emotional state, not following a process, you're more likely to make the wrong decision. And so for me, it's not about do I want to or do I need to? It's, this is what's best because our emotions can deceive us. You know, they're not always right. They're not always hopeful. And so for me, I've always had to put safeguards in place to make sure that I make decisions based in logic because emotion goes all over the place, fluctuates every day. I would say that the first example of that was when I made the list about the partner I wanted in life, because, you know, transparently, I had been in relationships and I recognized that, you know, it's funny. I've, I, I admire all the people I've been in relationships with. Did not end on a bad note with anybody. I wish them the best. Some of them I can still talk to. Some of them Alex has been. Most were really great people. They just didn't want the same things as I did in life. And so because of that, it sent me down a little bit of a different path. Because the person you're with influences you so heavily. And so, you know, when I'm in my younger 20s and I'm at a very like, I'm at a fluctuation point. I recognized that the people or the person I was with was not the person that was going to help me get to my goals. And so I said, like, why do I keep ending up with these people, right? And I read one of Tony Robbins' books about, I think it was Unleashed Power Within. Mm -hmm. And he talked about picking a partner out of logic. And so I made this list and it was like a whole page long. And then I made a list of non-negotiables. And it was all the traits that I wanted this person to have. And then it was all the non-negotiables that I have, which were only a couple, right? It's just like, okay, you don't, like there's some hard lines, right? Like don't cheat, don't hit me, like, you know, be ethical person. I want somebody who has good heart. You know, something like that. Don't lie. 
Honesty is really important to me. And then I looked at the list of all the traits and I said, great. So when I go on dates, I'm going to, when I get back, I'm going to look at my list and I'm just going to say like, do they have this traits or not? And I'm going to use that rather than my emotions because my emotions have been deceiving me. And that list was like the best thing I could have ever done for myself. Because I'll tell you, there was one guy that I was like, oh, wait, you know, I was like, wow, I think this guy is like my next boyfriend. Also, I came home and I looked at the list. <laughs> this is not it. Like, it was total, like, butterfly emotions. Mm. There was no evidence to support that we would make good life partners, right? Mm. And so I felel grateful for it because every decision I'd made prior to that was just based on my gut and based on what felt good in the moment and what, you know, was enticing. And, you know, like there's this desire when you're like, oh, it's this new person. It's all exciting. It's fun. It's like you like being in the, the beginning of things. And I remember I just like, after that, I was like, all right, I can't see this guy again because you know what? I'm going to trust the process because I've realized I can't trust my feelings every day, all day, all the time, especially around things like this, where they have steered me wrong to the past. And so it worked because the next time I used that list, it was, it's so funny. I've been going on dates for about 18 months. And finally, I was going to go on a date with this guy named Alex. And I woke up that day and I was like, dude, I, I'm just, I'm going to be honest. I was like, I am defeated. Like I, I'd had such a bad date like two weeks before that I was just like, goodness, like I don't want to go on another first date and like feel so awkward, just have like the worst situation ever and just like have to awkwardly leave and avoid a kiss and like all these things. And so I texted him and I was like, yeah, I can't go. I'm sick. And the guy calls me. He was like, you don't sound sick. And I was like, okay. And, you know, I liked that because I said, I want someone who's assertive. I don't like somebody who's too passive because I'm pretty assertive and Confront, not confrontational, but direct. And so I was like, I can't have a guy who's not. Otherwise, it's going to be like an awkward dynamic. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'll go on a date with him. And, you know, we went on the date and there wasn't like some giant emotional spark. But I really liked talking to him. I was really interested in him. And when I went home, I pulled up that list and I looked at it and I was like, holy shit, this guy passes all the boxes. Like, whoa. And it was weird because I was like, there was this odd dissonance because my feelings weren't supporting it. It was like, yeah, he was cool and interesting, but it wasn't like anything that I had for past relationships. And man, that was the best decision I ever made in my life. Yeah. Like that was the best decision I ever made in my entire life. And it wasn't based on my feelings. It was based on process. So you don't subscribe to listen to your gut. Here's the thing. What is my gut? People say, well, what about your, what is my intuition? Please tell me the difference. I, I don't. And I get it because I used to be the person. I think I'm great gut most of the time. In many situations, when my emotions are low, gut intuition, what do I think gut intuition is? In my opinion, what it is, is that you've had a past experience similar to this situation yeah. or many past experiences similar. The more past experiences, the stronger the gut feeling. And so then when you have that feeling, it's actually rooted in evidence. Mm -hmm. But we as humans are lazy. And so we don't say, I've had 17 guys like this that I've dated and they've all been shitheads. We say, I have a gut feeling this guy is a shithead. <laughs> yeah. And right, right. And so it's not that I don't think like gut, I think it's experience. And so I, I always say evidence, 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 evidence above all, because that protects us from our feelings. And so for me, if I have a gut feeling about somebody, I will say, you know what? This person has traits similar to these other five people that I hired in the past. And those five people didn't work out in this company. That leads me to believe that people with these traits don't fit in well with our culture. That is much more palatable. And that is something that I can explain to somebody. But, you know, if I go to the CEO of Fortune 500 company or one of my portfolio company CEOs running a $300 million company, I say, my gut feeling says, this is what we should do. How useful is that to anybody else? Yeah. And so I think it's that. And I also think that the reason that I speak against listening to your gut, Evelyn, is because the amount of women that I talk to that tell me, my gut says, it's not their gut, it's fear. Okay. It's fear. And they disguise it with my gut told me not to. My gut said, 
And I just sit there and you know what I see through is I see that they're just terrified Mm -hmm. and that they want to run the other way. But that in order to become the woman they want to become, they need to run towards it. And I know because I've done it. And so I just don't want that for people. And listen, not everybody wants their life to be challenging and to continue to grow. But I think most people who listen to me do. And so I just haven't found it to be the best advice for people because it's very hard for people to decipher between genuine experience that you've had and true terror Mm -hmm. because our minds will play tricks on us to get us to run in the opposite direction of fear. Yeah, that's so powerful. You have this interesting relationship with not only fear, but also discomfort. So almost like you were talking about labelings just a second ago, right? About labeling stuff. And Alex released this video recently about the maker and the manager. Yeah. And then I thought that was helpful. I'm like, oh, I'm a maker, right? So now, uh, and then a little bit later, I listened to a podcast uh, from, from you and you like, oh yeah, I think I can, uh, that switching between different tasks is just that you switch your head up and then it's just a skill to acquire to switch between different tasks, right? So in one situation, it's like really helpful because you explain kind of what's an ideal setup, like a rule of thumb. On the other hand, there are you where you like, actually, I believe that there is an opportunity to acquire a skill, which is painful right now. But every day after I have acquired that skill, I'm having, I'm coming from a position of disproportionate advantage to everybody who's not capable of switching situations. So I would love to know from you, how do you, because you seem to have developed such an eye on it, how do you identify like, oh, this is a constraint because of a, of a behavior or skill that I'm lacking? Like, how do you see that skill? And then how do you go from, this is the skill gap that I can really pinpoint to a plan to acquire the skill. And I would love to be a little bit selfish here and give you an example for something that I've struggled with for years is yeah. uh, people-pleasing boundaries, for example. I... I have recognized lack of skill, but I'm not able to pinpoint what exactly is the gap. And I've read all the books, podcasts, therapy, coaches, and I still feel it's not working. So in those situations, you know, how do you really isolate down to this is where I'm missing the mark and and here's what I'm going to do about it. You benefit more from people pleasing than when you don't. If you didn't benefit from doing it, why would you keep doing it? That's how humans work. And so, okay, let's look at something real real life right now. Yeah. You were incredibly kind when I met you and you were like, hello, look, like just very giving generous energy. And I said, let, yes, I'll take the podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, that's not people pleasing directly, but it is probably close enough that just the, the traits that lead into people pleasing also bleed into all these other areas and all these things benefit you. That's true there. So, big portion of success that kind of comes from generosity. Yeah, and being a good person. So I would ask yourself this, which is, do you need to eliminate it altogether? Probably not. Do you have a problem with it? Like, where is it damaging your life? That's a good question. I think it is when I have learned that being kind and polite, right? Yeah. is genuinely helpful. Yeah. And then there are people that who have kind of a good sense for boundaries and they, and then there are people that kind of sense that you might have weak boundaries. And then my, and I have learned that it's good to be kind and polite, stops me from saying, uh, sorry, <laughs> you can't get in. I don't have the, the time, the capacity that I don't want to do this. So I feel like this is kind of where it might break to kind of see the intent or even see the intention. Yeah. But then I, I fail to shut down the, the blights, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you're in a situation and the people are not the people you want to please because they are crossing a boundary, mm-hmm. right? Which they don't know about the boundary, mm-hmm. but they're crossing it mm-hmm. for you. And you don't say no, you say yes instead. Mm-hmm. What happens before you say yes? I do push back, but probably not assertive enough. Yeah. I think this is the, ah, that, that's so helpful. I think this is the point that, that is really bothering me. It's like, um, I do then politely decline. And when then pushback comes, I fall like a house of cards, right? And then I disappoint myself and I also feel violated and I resent the person. Yeah. So it might be a lack of assertiveness. I think that 
it might just be that you lack the skill of learning how to say no in a way that doesn't make you feel icky. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll give you an example, right? So I'm walking, I'm going to walk the other day. And I run into someone, someone who watches the content and they're a fan, super nice person. But then they're like, can I stop by your office? And I was like, Bill. <laughs> and then he, he looks at me and he was like, oh shit, okay. And then he starts cracking up. And I was like, love you, dude. And then, but I didn't say like, no. I was like, no. <laughs> and for me, yeah. what I have found is that, you know, I have had to put boundaries in place in areas like that. Mm-hmm. The amount of times a guy asks for my phone number or something, and I'll just be like, no. <laughs> and so that has been what I have found has worked for me. And I think for you, it's literally just that you need to figure out like, what is your not icky no? Mm-hmm. What's a no that feels good to you? And it's literally as simple as rehearsing it. Mm-hmm. I'll give you another example. So I don't like it when men that I don't know come up and hug me without asking. Mm -hmm. It started happening a lot. When I started making content, I'd be in public. People would come up and they would grab me without even saying anything. And so there was a time where I was at an event and there was a lot of people drinking and I had multiple guys come up and it just felt very violating because, you know, it was an environment we're all wearing, we're the 90 degree heat, girls are wearing, you know, not a lot of clothing, guys not wearing shirts. I had multiple guys come up. I'm just like, this is not okay with me. I'm married. It just feels weird, yeah. right? And you're sweaty and it's gross. And so, you know, I'm telling my friend, I don't understand why they would come up to a woman who's married that they don't know and just hug me. It feels so violating. And she was like, oh, Leila, it's so simple. You just go like this. And I was like, what do you mean? And she goes, you just have to practice. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you have to practice it. I was like, because some guy, because then I come back to her and I was like, I, I, but he still came up to me. She's like, did you do this? And I was like, well, no. And she's like, all right, let's do it right now. So she would come to hug me. I go, oh, I don't hug. <laughs> right? And so I practiced it with her. Yeah. And then I have security guy. I practiced it with him. And so I just kept practicing. When anyone would come back to me, oh, I don't hug. But in a nice way, right? Mm-hmm. Just like if I'm at an event with 500 people and I've been sick recently, a lot of people come to shake my hand, hug me. I'm so sorry I've been sick. Put my hands like this, mm-hmm. Right? And so I don't think that you have anything wrong with you. This is not some big emotional thing. You just need to figure out a way that you feel good saying no. Yeah. You know, I realize that when I say no like this, people laugh. So that becomes a positive for me. I feel good saying no because I know people are going to get a chuckle out of it. Yeah. You know, like sometimes people are like, can I get your number? I'm like, I don't think Alex would like that. You know, (laughs) like I have found that humor and being lighthearted works really well for me to keep boundaries. And they were like, no, for real, can I? And I'm like, no, I'm for real too. (laughs) And that's what works for me, yeah. right? And then I don't feel, because I am not a mean person. So like being like, no. And like, you know, some women, they're like, Lord, I'm saying no. And I'm like, yeah. And it doesn't feel good. It does not, it doesn't feel good. I don't want to make people feel bad. I just don't want you up in my shit. (laughs) So that's it. Yeah, you don't want to make the people feel bad. Exactly, exactly. So you just need to figure out what is your version of no? Like just find, it's like learning how to dance. Like what's your dance? Is it this? Is it no? Is it like, you could even be like, you know, I feel really apart I'm having a hard time saying no to recently, but I can't do that. You don't have to give an explanation. You don't have yeah. to give a reason, but you could be honest. And then practice it. I know it sounds dumb, but like me practicing this with 10, 20 people, 10, 20 times now, guess what happens? Somebody comes out like, I don't have it. It just yeah. comes naturally. Yeah. I don't have to think about it and I don't have to judge myself for it. It makes so much sense. And it's so interesting how, Changing such a little thing actually has such a disproportionately positive impact on your daily life, right? So that's yeah, absolutely powerful. I would love to circle back. Can you see what you did when you helped me isolate that? Oh. Because <laughs> I would really love to be able to do that or kind of yeah. see, kid, is there is there something we can do that we yeah. can repeat what you just did there? Yeah, so a lot of people, I think, when they're trying to make a change, they look at the entire event, say it's your overeating. And they're like, I ate a piece of cake and I had the ice cream and I had the this and I had the this. And what I look at is what was the trigger moment, which is like, you had to open the door of the refrigerator, right? Or maybe you got bad news from your boss or maybe. And so for me, in my opinion, it's finding them, not that, because there's a chain of actions that occur, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's finding the micro action. There's just one small piece of the linking of those actions. It's the first one. 
And that's the only one that you need to change or you need to interfere with. You need to replace it with a different behavior. A lot of people see this huge chain of behaviors and say, I need to change all of these. The reality is you need to change the one that comes right before it goes into the thing that you don't want to have happen. And so it, latency and immediacy are more important than anything else. And so if you can interfere right before that chain of the rest of the behaviors are going to happen, you can change all of them. Mm-hmm. But that one micro behavior. And so I just find it, it's much easier for me to change my own behavior and to change other people's behaviors if I find that micro one right before everything else happens. You know, for example, I'll think of another one. I know that, for example, uh, I did a podcast on this recently, but like, you know, with people in the workplace, sometimes when people don't want something to happen, they'll act a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, they don't want to have a lot of work, they'll act out, right? So I just find like, what happens right before they start acting cranky, right? Mm -hmm. And so like a tool that I have is humor, which is like, if I buy in, to their crankiness. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? I'm so sorry, it's really hard. And I'm just like, that's how she goes, man. <laughs> and I start acting like that. It changes the entire linking of behaviors and they don't act like that at all. And so I think that it's, you know, Tony Robbins talks about like breaking state. I think it's kind of similar to what I'm saying, but I say it's breaking the chain, which is like, what's the one domino that if you tip it in the other direction, it's gonna tip, the rest of them either won't tip at all or go a different direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, makes a lot. Of, makes so, so, so much sense. You spent a lot of time, right, understanding behavior and understanding how to teach others as well. I would love to know, do you have a few more insights like this where you're like, oh, this is a real quick win. I wish I had um, known about this earlier. And then maybe also some resources for people that want to go really deeper and educate themselves. I think that there's a big difference if you have a company and you want to hire people, you want to get the best out of people, you want people to do good work in your company, whether it's one person, two people, 10 people. And maybe you want to have a good group of friends. Like I think this can apply to all of these, but I think that understanding the difference between insulting somebody and Mm -hmm. critiquing somebody has allowed me to hold people accountable without it feeling heavy and feeling punishing. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say to me, well, I don't know how to hold people accountable because, you know, I feel like I'm just being an asshole, I feel like I'm being mean, whether it be like a spouse and somebody they're supposed to do together, a friend that had a commitment or somebody in their company who has, you know, things they're supposed to do to make the company money. And a lot of the times because a lot of traditional management teaches us to tell somebody, oh, here's how you're acting. Don't do that anymore, right? So when I have a hard conversation, I confront them, I'm going to say, you can't do this anymore. Okay, well, what you're doing is you're having that person focus on all the bad stuff but they don't know what to do instead. And so it's that as well as a lot of times, I'll give you an example, right? So I was watching um, a Selling Sunset and Mary yelled at Christine. And she, I remember this moment when I thought about this, she's like, you just can't be doing this shit no more. She was like, what shit? And she's like, you, sh- you just act like a bitch. I need you to stop acting like a bitch and just stop being a bitch. Okay, so you did not critique her. Mm-hmm. You insulted her, which means you attacked her as the person rather than what she did. And it's, you need to focus on the do rather than the who. This could be in marriage, friends, business, it does not matter. Insulting a person and calling them a name, you know, associating them with something negative does not make people get better. But what you can do is two things, right? If you want someone to get better, you want to critique behavior. You talk about you told me your goal was this. So it's like, example, right? Husband never wants to tell the wife when she said she's going on a diet and you see her eating the ice cream, right? And he's like, I cannot say anything. I can't tell you how many guys say this. But if the husband asks her about her goal that she displayed him and he says like, oh yeah, he sees her eating ice cream. I think that's great. Like you told me your goal was to get here. Like, I'm, are you on track? Like how far are you in hitting that goal? It doesn't come off as something so negative, right? Because you're just engaging, asking them about their progress towards the goal. And it's the same way in business, which is like, okay, yeah, you had that goal of hitting this many sales this month. Where are you at right now? Right? And so it's talking about the future we're going towards and the activity they're doing, not who they are as a person. And so I have used that in, I mean, probably more in my relationship than I have even in business, but also in business is just learning how to use, I'd say like future facing behavior rather than like past dwelling behavior. I simplify these words. Because if you focus on the future and all the things we're working towards, 
people forget about the past and all behaviors that are linked with yeah. it. And so if you look at, like, for example, for me, right? Gosh, when I was like 17 and I was angry and getting arrested all the time, I went to therapy and the therapist was always asking me, tell me about your mom. We can't move on and you can't get better unless you talk about your mom. What happened? And every time I would just go into the session and I would just start talking about this, this terrible thing that happened and how I felt, it would reopen this wound over and over and over again. But what do you do with that? Yeah. And I ended up going and seeing a different therapist and she was like, I'm going to talk about your role. Mm -hmm. And she, I remember she said, she's like, you're an adult. What are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And that, it was like the best thing anybody could have ever said to me. Because I was like, thank, I remember thinking in my mind, I was like, thank God. I'm so sick of talking about this. I'm so sick of talking. I don't like talking about the past. People ask me now, but then she tell me about, I don't even think about, I don't even think about yesterday. I'm so focused on the future and going forward. I just don't think the past is relevant. And it doesn't help us get better. But like focusing on the future and the skills that we need to attain to, to make that future come true and come to life, that helps us get better. And so I think for a lot of people, you know, in terms of understanding behavior, if you beat yourself up and think about your past and think about all the mistakes you've made, you do to yourself the same things I talk about how these bosses and these spouses do to those people. And a lot of people can get it right with others, but they don't get it right with themselves. And I think that that is a huge unlock for people to change, which is relinquishing yourself from anything that happened prior to the present moment. Not because it's invalid and not because it didn't happen, but because it's not useful. You're not going to become the person you want to become by dwelling on the things that happened a week ago. It's rather just looking at the discrepancy between where I am today and where I want to be in 10 years or tomorrow or a month from now. And so for me, I have a lot of things from my past that I could consider shameful and I could dwell on. And I did for a period of time. You know, I felt really ashamed about like how fat I was, how many times I got arrested, like just a lot of things I did. That didn't help me. It didn't make me a better person. It didn't help me hit my goals. Looking at where I wanted to go and what skills I needed to acquire to get there, always did. Mm -hmm. That's so helpful. Do you, what you said that that's the secret behind your rate of growth? Because what... What just blows my mind about you and, and having watched you, you know, it's just, it goes boom, 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 boom. You know, the, the rate in which you adapt and change and learn, uh, is that connected with, you know, not dwelling at all? Or um, what, are some, what are some of the things that you do that allow you to basically adapt so quickly and change behavior so quickly? I think that it's the fact that I don't dwell on failure. I can try again much faster than other people because I don't, I don't judge myself for it anymore and I don't make it mean something. And I don't even need to figure out why it didn't work. It just didn't. And so for me, I just get back up and I try the next thing. Whether it be personally, professionally, I just want to get the reps in. And so for me, I think one, I am a little bit obsessed. So like any, everything I do, like, you know, you look at like mastery 10,000 hours. I put in pretty much every hour of every day into thinking about business and thinking about growth and thinking about people and leadership and how to build a great company. You know, it's like what I think about when I wake up or when I go to bed. That helps me a lot in terms of I spend a lot of time on something. The second thing, though, is a lot of people try something and it doesn't work and then they just get stuck on it. And I've just recognized that, especially in my business, that just gets me nowhere. Um, I make just as many mistakes as anybody, probably more than anybody in my own company. And I'm okay with it. I don't think it's a bad thing. I use myself as an example all the time to tell others, like, look at these things I did wrong. Like, you can make mistakes too. And I actually think that's why our companies are able to grow quickly is because I, I try really hard to create an environment where people are not afraid to fail. And when they do fail, we don't dwell on the failure. We just talk about, okay, what are we going to do next time? Mm -hmm. Like, lost a half million dollars. What are we going to do next time? Okay. Because then you feel safe to try things. And when you feel safe to try things, you go a lot faster. Think about it, right? So like if you're trying a bike for the first time, right? And every time you fall, you fall into like this cushy pad, right? It doesn't hurt. You don't get fucked up. You don't get scrapes or whatever. You're going to ride way faster. And your, your skill at riding a bike is going to increase that much faster than the person who every time they fall, it's painful. They're bleeding. They have to put all these bandages on there to cast, right? The thing is, is that the gravel or like the, the street, the pavement that we're falling on is our, is in our own minds. Yeah. And so 
I just try my best to create an environment where I just detach myself from that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is if I go to like, where does my mind go? Something will happen. I will feel a pang of anxiety. I will want to do something about it, want to talk about it, want to dwell on it. And then I tell myself that will help. Mm -hmm. You'll make it worse. Dwelling on it makes it worse. Move forward. And it, this is always where my mind goes now. It's like, don't do that. As much as I may really want to, I really, really yeah. want to do that thing. I try really hard not to. Mm -hmm. And that reinforces that it also gets easier over time. Yeah, it does get easier over time. Because every time we resist any kind of type of urge or compulsion, it's easier tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I always think about like, well, is the behavior that I'm about to execute going to make me better or worse tomorrow? Mm -hmm. If the answer is worse, I would rather take the pain today than the pain tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That probably also creates acceleration in learning. It's like, okay, pain, give it a right now. Yeah. I wanted to ask you something in that regard of learning from past mistakes. So I'm one of those entrepreneurs stuck around the three million a year mark. And uh, I watched uh, the talk that you had there in a conference room, which I felt was so interesting from the entrepreneurs that were kind of at this level. And there were two scenarios that I found particularly uh, relevant kind of for, for my situation and also for this conversation around growth. One was uh, uh, this guy, he has the sales rep, it didn't work out. So uh, he asked you, should I jump back into the business or should I try to rescue him? You advised, jump back into the role, right? It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be uh, bones for a while. And I'm at that situation in my business. So after February, I changed a lot about operational management. Also because of Alex's recommendation, he kind of spotted it from all the front where he was like, you know, operations. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah. And it kind of, it, it unwrapped itself with with the team structure, things changed. I jumped back in to take a lot of work back on myself. And, you know, it was a correcting course. And I think in like a month or two, we're having so much momentum again yeah. that I feel, okay, I'm ready to attempt another round. But now I'm also maybe at this point where I'm seeing like, building team is this whole problem, right? Yeah. So I don't want to make the same mistake again. And there are three kind of specific things that, that I'm really struggling with to understand. The first one is one person full-time or hourly experts for stuff. The other one is that uh, based on something that you said, I thought I have a really big vision so everybody can fit. And my vision was I want to allow people to grow their personal brand, undermine when they coach people, for example. And then they can also do one-to-one -one work with the people. And so I really tried to empower because I thought that that would lead to a, a form of incentive alignment and having a sense of ownership and commitment. Yeah. But it didn't add up to that. And now I'm not sure, did I just do a poor job selecting the person or was that not a good idea altogether? And should I focus on the brand, Evelyn? And there's a team, Evelyn, that is a little bit more anonymous because you know, when things don't work out, you communicate obviously with your community and you can manage kind of what's going on, but you don't want to expose them kind of often to now you have this relationship with this person and, and now, you know, they're gone. Or maybe it, though, though, and the third one is just in general, how do we create when we grow so fast and when we're doing well kind of financially, how do we avoid kind of overcompensating or creating entitlements with the incentive structures? What are incentives that we can give though that don't create entitlement or jealousy in those stages? Understood. So First and second question kind of go together, right? Because mm -hmm. you're asking me, do I do the full-time versus the expert? Because mm -hmm. I'm guessing those experts are people. Tell me what your current model is so I understand. Uh, so the current model is basically, it's a mixture of content community and consulting. Yeah. So basically um, I have content that is provided and we have a community where there's kind of written feedback. Now with, with school, I actually have members helping members, which is much better because there's the connection points between them. And then there is the consulting part where, for example, you can submit your copy or your Facebook ads and you get a review. And so um, right now I'm testing in, a, in one community, doing all of that just myself. And in the other communities, um, you know, I still have coaches. But the, the main problem was, you know, bringing people on for kind of first level support. And then that didn't work out and it was making it was making a really bad experience for the members because they felt like, oh, I have to jump through so many hoops to actually get to Evelyn and they just didn't feel, yeah, they, they were feeling that there's not this immediate connection anymore. Because there's other people rather than Because you. there's other people, yes. And it, um, it didn't translate to 
And, you know, I put a lot of effort also into kind of making it the same level of skill and everything, but still, you know, people would prefer to hear from me. And I also know kind of how to deliver this in a scalable format, but I was not sure, am I supposed to do that still, or am I supposed to not do that? So I tried to professionalize, but it kind of made everything worse and even more (laughs) challenging for me and for the members. I'll tell you what thousand foot I would say, Mm -hmm. which is that you're at the point where you have a skill deficit, which is learning how to train people properly Mm -hmm. and select the right people, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, I'll give you an example, right? Gym launch. I didn't have the skills I have now. You know, four years in, we switched to a model. We have these coaches who are experts. Lots of them would leave and take people with them, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, is this even the right model? Because like they're, I'm like investing in them and they're like leaving and taking these people, Mm -hmm. right? But now, for example, I have people on my team, they're on social media, they're in my blogs, they're on the website, they get people left and right banging on their doors, but they're the right people. And I trust that if they wanted to leave, they would also tell me, you know, and it would be like a conversation because I now have skill of learning how to train them to be, to, I would say like, use my voice, right? In the areas that it makes sense, in areas that they're representing me. And on the other side, I have now the skill to really discern what type of person is right for my business. Mm -hmm. And that took a long time to learn. And there's nothing that can accelerate that except for reps and doing it. Yeah. Now I would say this, which is you have to decide what type of business you will. My type of business that like everything I talk about, that's not the only way to do things. I have plenty of friends who are one man shows. It's like they are the business. I just have never wanted things to be that way. Even with my own content, you know, I people have said recently, like, content's got really good. Well, that's probably because we have a whole team now on my content and I interact with them every day. And I just said to ads, so I was like, I got to do this the same way I do everything. It's a team that builds my content, not just me. And so I think you have to ask yourself, what type of business do you want to run and what type of life do you want to have? Because it's a very different type of business. It's a very different type of life that goes with it and pros and cons to both. Neither is right or wrong. Both work. Both have their own limitations. Which one do you want? I guess it's a question of how successful can a one man or one woman show be? Not as successful as the other one. Right. But then again, in success means but different things for different people. Are I'll say this. To do the trade up. The likelihood that the business, like your business, if you used to just be your face, will be easier especially in the short term, harder in the long term. The likelihood it becomes a $200 million business is low. The other way of getting experts and teaching people and training people and creating incentive plans, all those things, much harder in the short term, much more likely to succeed in the long term and has a lot more scalability. So the likelihood that you could become a $100 million business is much higher. And so that's how I would look at it. The difficulty and is that this is, Leadership and management, people are like, can you teach me leadership? And I'm like, yes, let me write 20 books. Leadership is a combination of 50 skills. Whereas something like sales is like, and sales is hard. It's probably like 10 or 15, right? Leadership is like, you have to know sales. You have to know marketing. You have to know what gets people to do things. You have to understand CS. You have to, like, you have to understand all these things and all these skills around managing people, influencing people that, you don't need if you're doing any one of these things. And so the reason that a lot of people give up is because it takes a long time to get those skills. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times what happens is the business is growing faster than your skill set is. Yeah. This happened to me too. Mm-hmm. And I realized it. And I think that the best thing that I ever did was just keep trying. Because I said to myself, like, well, what kind of business do I want? I was like, I want to build something that like impacts the world one day. You know, and I'm not there yet. And I don't even think I'm there now. But like, if I even want a shot at doing that and it really impacted the amount of people I say I want to impact, I have to learn how to do this. And so if it means that I get less in the short term, that's fine with me. It's also the type of business I want to run. I don't want to feel like, I'll come back to this. So when I was a personal trainer, I decided I want to do a bikini competition. And I thought doing this competition would be so inspirational people and so this and all these things. And I did the competition. And I remember at the end of it, you know, I stepped on stage. I got second place. I nationally qualified. And the first thought I had was, 
I never want to do this again. And the reason why the first word that popped in my mind is this is selfish. It doesn't, I'm not on a team. I'm doing everything alone. And I don't want to keep doing everything alone. It felt so lonely. It was like everything I'm doing is to serve me. And I don't have a lot of people bought in on my vision. How many people care if I win an Olympia, right? Maybe when, once you get to the top, but on the way, it's like, okay, so you're like working out a lot and eating chicken. And so the difficulty is that with the model where it's one face is that it's very hard to recruit people to help build your vision because the vision is you. And so for me, I, I prefer to take the harder route. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the decision for you to make right now. Now, in terms of the people being the experts and all those things, like, you know, sometimes what you need to do is you need to sacrifice their expertise for somebody who is a culture fit, who you know will be loyal and not leave. And you have to invest a lot of time into training them. Yeah. You know, I have people that, okay, so I was, we had an event not that long ago and a guy said something, he's like, well, you know, because somebody's not really onboarded for six to 12 months. And I was like, thank you. That's the best thing I've ever heard anybody say, because <laughs> it's true. It takes six to 12 months to even integrate yeah. somebody fully into the business. And so, you know, I look at it as like, okay, how long do I need to invest in this person? But how much am I going to get out of them if I get somebody who I invest that much in? Yeah. And so I think for you, you know, finding people who are, you have to understand your avatar, which yeah. is like, at what point in their journey are they? They need to be able to have a large amount that they learn from you. Mm -hmm. If they don't have, they only have this much they're going to learn from you, they don't get a lot of value from working for you. Yeah. Whereas if they have this much, they get a lot of value out of working for you. It's harder for you at first, but it pays off in the long term. And mm -hmm. people who learn, people who learn more in the workplace stay four or five times as long as people who have nothing to learn in the workplace. So I would reconsider what type of person you're looking for for those roles. Because what I found in the past is that I just selected the wrong people. I think that makes a lot of sense. And that kind of drives towards one person you can really invest in and uh, maybe, you know, so drag along all day, which is uh, to really invest in, in getting them there. I think about this, right? Like if you found somebody who's just like, I admire the shit out of Evelyn and like, I just would do anything to work for her. And then you invest in that person and you know they're a good person and they're honest and they're trustworthy and they're loyal. Do you think that within three to four months you could teach that person the things in one area of expertise so that they could help teach the students? For sure. It's hard, but and it takes yeah. a lot of fucking time. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I look at it like this, like I grow people and the business will grow. Yeah. If I grow the people, the business will grow. And so at some point, you alone... It's going to be difficult to grow the business. You can do it. But I also tell you, like, I have so many friends who are the face of their business and they're so lonely and they're so mm -hmm. stressed and their business is at 15, 20 million and they're the face and they're doing everything. Yeah. They don't have a team of loyal employees or teammates that want to win with them because they don't feel like it's a team. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, it's actually just the genius with a thousand helpers and they don't like the fact that they're one of the thousand. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the big vision to fit was the right idea to execution with the shit. Yeah. We just have to try again. You just have, it takes, listen, leadership and management and managing people is going to take more reps than a lot of other things because it has more skills involved and you have to identify which of those skills that you're missing. I mean, I'll tell you, my vision for my content, what inspires me in making my brand is that I would love my brand to be big enough one day that when I have people in my company that... I want to put up and say like, you know what? This person is going to go off and start their own thing. I can like pump them up. I can help them start it. Mm. Maybe acquisition.com is a board advisor. And then I can put them on my platform and say like, go to this person. You know, I got that from the Kardashians. Yeah. Hair, makeup, friends. It's like they all have their own businesses that they have little pieces of, right? But they've helped them get that success by elevating them with their platform. Yeah. And I was like, wow, how cool would it be if I could do that for my team by having a platform, you know? Yeah. And so... I say that to people and I share that with my team. If you have a vision like that, share it with them. Because I think also the bigger that you, like, it's like everyone wants to hold back. Everyone wants to reserve and they want to say like, oh no, because like, what if they leave? Fuck that shit. Like, so what? They're going to leave and it's going to suck and it's going to be hard. Like, business is tough. And so for you, I can tell that you genuinely want the best for them. Like, let it out. 
tell them, you know, be loud about it. I think that's the one regret I have of my last company is I was not loud about how much I wanted to do for the people on my team mm-hmm. because I was scared of being taken advantage of. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, you know, I think when you have been taken advantage of, like a few times you start to have like this, almost like a protective posture. Then you create the situation that you're avoiding. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So almost like, you know, you... uh you had a bad relationship and now you'd say, oh, I'm not emotionally available for my new partner because I had a bad relationship. Really. Exactly. Like, well, that's tough. Mm-hmm. That's so, so helpful. When it comes to kind of learning these skills, I, I believe that very often, or maybe the question changes now. Yeah. Um, did I attempt for the big strategy too early before acquiring the skill? So I, I kind of would love to get to the point to understand at what level, what skill set, how do you properly assess where you are? And, you know, what levels do you see kind of in business growth journeys? And where would you say, okay, if you're making multiple six figures a year, like this skill set, you need to have it nailed down. If you're going to the multiple seven mark, like this skill set, I want you to have down. Do you have kind of framework for that? I would say that generally there's skills needed that are technical skills. I think a lot of leadership comes down to like more emotional skills. But I would also say this, which is like, you don't get the skills by sitting on the sideline and reading fucking books. Yeah. You get the skills by doing the thing. Mm -hmm. So is it that you need the skills to hit that kind of revenue? Or is it that you start hitting that kind of revenue and you gain the skills to make sure that you can keep going? Chicken or the egg? I don't know. And so I would say that in the beginning, there's a lot less people skills needed. You know, to sell somebody one time on the phone or through a webinar is actually fairly easy compared to well, this is what I would say, selling somebody every day on the fact that they work for you and every hour of every day that they put in is for you. Yeah. That's a sale that you make every moment of every day with the people on your team. And so what I see a lot of the times is that people, to get started, you know, to go from zero to a million, being able to sell something consistently. So it's like you have the skill of selling and influencing and you have the skill of consistency. You can stick with something, right? Because in the beginning, you're all like this. And then to get to a million a year, it's like you have to learn how to be consistent, have a schedule, manage yourself. And then to get to 3 million, you have to learn how to manage some people, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be able to have vendors, agencies, a couple people that can help you get to where you need to go. But then at 3 million, then it's like, oh, I need to be able to duplicate myself. And that's when it's really the point of like, I have to be able to give something to someone and they have to be able to do it as well or better than me. Otherwise, the company does not work. And so at that point, it's learning how to train people. And that is where I would say the biggest thing comes into play, which is giving feedback. How do you train people? You watch them do something, you give them feedback on the thing they did. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't watch enough or don't give proper feedback. And proper feedback means the behavior changes. If you give feedback to somebody, the behavior doesn't change. The feedback was not feedback. Mm -hmm. Because feedback in depth and out of definition means that behavior changes. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people, I think, don't put the time into that that's actually required to get people to be trained up. I would say that at the point you're at right now, it's putting in those feedback systems so that you can constantly be giving people feedback about what they're doing well. I say it like praise them into success. Mm -hmm. Like I'm constantly trying to find opportunities to tell people what they did well and constantly trying to put myself in situations where I have visibility, where I can watch them do their job and give them feedback so I can get them going in the right direction as fast as possible. And that's a whole other thing you have to do. And so it's like, well, people are like, well, I'm still doing these other things. Well, the faster that you learn how to train people, the faster you can hand off those other things. And so a lot of times it's you hand off the thing and you do it with them first, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm going to be holding their hand while we're doing it together. And then you hand it to them and say, you do it now. I'm going to watch you. And I'm just going to give you feedback until it's where it needs to be. It just requires a lot of patience a level of, I would say, like, social ability, because you have to be, like, talking to people all the time rather than, like, working by yourself, which is usually, like, a different, a change in going from a million to three million to 10 million. Yeah, I talk to a lot less people in the business at one or two million than at 10, 15, 20, 50. Like, it just, the amount that you interact with people only continues to go up, basically. Yeah. That's really the switch that I think has to occur. You know, great leaders give great feedback. And great feedback changes behavior. And if you can change their behavior enough, then you can get people to do the things that you've been doing. That's so, so helpful. 
I would love to also circle back on another question that I saw you answering there and really, really well. There was this lady and she asked you basically, do I double down on my organic or do I go into paid ads? You said paid ads, huge learning curve. You're not max out your potential with the organic. So do that, but also make sure it works. And she was like, yeah, I'm sure it works because when I'm running this challenge, then uh, we get good results. And you're like, why are we not running the challenge like all year round? Yeah. Right? And so in kind of the, uh, or under the umbrella of growth, having an all year round growth system for your business, right? A lot of people cannot stick with that either because they cannot identify like, oh, this is the growth thing that we did that we should be doing again. Or they're like, yeah, this is the growth thing we did, but it was super exhausting. So let me give like three months of casual business before I can even attempt or, you know, it has to go down to pain yeah. point before we can attempt it again. So I would love to know how can we identify which is this kind of and now to put in an analogy or um, this challenge, right? That she ran, that, that catapulted her, that we can maybe find in our own business. And then how do we build a year long growth system around it without burning out? People burn out because they don't use their teams. Mm. Like most people that burn out, this is the thing that's crazy. People quote, I'm just going to use the word burnout because you used it. Burn out. So many more people between 1 million to 3 million to, to even 10 million burn out than somebody that's at it has a $50 million business. Mm -hmm. Because I won't burn out because I know how to properly utilize resources. Yeah. Right. I know how to delegate. I know how to give things to my team. The only way to make business sustainable is to make sure it does not always all rely on you. Because if your workload is unsustainable and you're the one who runs the company, you're also the one who tells everybody what to do. So go tell people what to do and don't put it all on yourself. And, and that's really where this issue comes from. And so in terms of companies that go like this, you know, we actually, and right I'll anonymize this, I knew a couple of people and they had businesses where they would like do these launches and it was this up and down and all this stuff. And I, I remember, you know, telling Alex specifically, like this person will never get to the next level because they won't hire and train people to be as good or better than them. They wouldn't hire people to be as good or better than them because they didn't want to pay it. Or they wouldn't train people because they didn't have the time or patience. They would just get, they have very low frustration tolerance. And so I look at everything you just said as a symptom of this person did not know how to build a team. Because if you're doing things to the team, guess what? Teams love taking on hard challenges together. Yeah. I like doing hard stuff in business because I'm a fucking great team. And like when I get to do hard stuff, we get closer and we become a better team together. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it all alone, you're just dragging people across the finish line. That's the problem. It's not the business model. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that you try to do everything yourself. And we live in this culture of, I love individuality, but I also am not supportive of doing everything by yourself. Mm -hmm. It's like community is important feeling like you've created a place that has community and you have people that have your back and you have theirs and you get to do things together. Like it makes a hard challenge fun. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how else to do business. Like it has to be fun. You know, like I like the hard challenges that we have because I get to work more with people I like. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to go through challenges with them. Like the reason that, you know, I'm still so close with Baggy and Kale to run gym launch is like we were in the shit together during mm -hmm. COVID. You know, and me and Maggie and Kale and Alex, like we all were just like in it together, in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. And it made us so much closer. You know, I love them. And so it's missing. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just say it again. Like, it's so seldom that somebody that's running a much bigger business gets as burned out as somebody who's running a smaller one. It's because they're not running the whole thing themselves. Mm -hmm. They have other people running it. That makes so much sense. Do you still sometimes and do a like mishire and then if it happens to you how do you undo it with the least damage i admit when i'm wrong unfortunately because of labor laws and all those things like there's only so much for certain people that you can say i have found that when you let somebody go the more that you say the worse it is i used to think the opposite i used to think i have to tell them everything if you tell somebody all the reasons you let them go you basically are insulting them Here's all the reasons I'm letting go. Either I'm an idiot and you decided to work for one or you're an idiot and here's why. And so most of the time, I'm very professional about it. And I just try to do as much as I can to make it as, to remove as much embarrassment or as humiliation as I possibly can. And I try to do it quick. So if I realize somebody's not a fit and I'm mishired, I then basically, I'm like, all right, I'm, I need to exit this person and I need to say, why did I mishire? okay, you know what? We did this part of the interview process. Probably didn't 
we were going too fast, we missed this piece. Or, you know what, we thought we needed this, but we actually need this, and now I know that. Mm -hmm. This person's not gonna succeed here. Mm -hmm. And so, to the degree I can, I try to be as honest as possible, but I try to move quickly on these things. Like, I do not let them dwell. I don't like having it on my mind. I don't like my team being focused on it. And so I generally like to make a environment where when we do know that we're, we're certain that this is not the right person, we exit them real quickly because it's like they need to go find a place that they are the right person for. Yeah. And I'm holding them back by keeping them here. Now, does that mean I don't pay them like a generous severance, all those things? No, I do. I try to make sure I, I pay well when somebody's mm -hmm. not a right fit with the team. But like, you know, I'm like nine years into this. It doesn't get easier to be like, hi, bye. Like I, you're off the bus. Like it never feels good. People are, some people can act like really great at the moment and then they come and try to sue your ass. Like I've had everything. Wow. And so it just is what it is. Like I've recognized and now I just know if I fire someone, the relationship is often done unless it's mutual. So like there's been times where like it's leading up and we're both like, this is really not a fit and we can still talk after and be fine, mm -hmm. right? And maybe we'll work together in the future. I do have those instances, but when it's like, they want to be here and everyone knows that they shouldn't be here. I just know that that person is just going to associate me with this very negative event and they're probably just going to want to avoid me in the future. But there's the thing is like me keeping that person, I, I sacrifice the rest of the team and I sacrifice that vision that I told them I was going to get us to by keeping this one person. I can't even tell you how many businesses have one person preventing the whole thing from growing. It's like we have this one sales guy and because of him, I can't pay everybody else what I need to pay them. So I can't get talent. We can't scale sales. Like, so Jared's the reason that you can't scale your company? It's like, because they're afraid of a conversation. Yeah. And I just know that I'm going to be super nervous and I'm going to have like sweaty palms. I'm probably going to be up the night before. And I'm going to feel sick to my stomach and not eat. So what? I can get through that. You know what I mean? I'm not going to die. And so I just try to set the example every time I do it for everybody else. Do it the best way possible with as much grace. It is a situation that is really hard to turn into a positive for the other person. Yeah. I feel like a reason why I have often avoided situations like this is because I was always afraid of some sort of retaliation. Like when you just said, oh, th and then they can't try to sue you. And it's like, oh, I got to like sick to my stomach. Everybody it's, feels this way though. Like, listen, listen, yeah. nobody likes firing people. Like yeah. it's not, I hate firing people. Like what you're saying, like every person hates it. And yeah. every person's like, why do I avoid? Because it fucking sucks. <laughs> Okay. Like, what do you mean? Like, it just sucks. Like, I, I don't know what else to put. Like, it's not, there's no part of, I have to not like magically made it more, like less painful. Like, yeah. I just take the fucking hit. You know what I mean? And so like, you can take a hit too. It'll be fine. Yeah. Here's the thing. Nothing's ever as bad as you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't even tell you the amount of times so I'm like, oh my God, get extra security at the building because this place is going to go crazy. <laughs> you know? And then it's like nothing because most people are also, they, they want to move on too, you know? That makes so much sense. Yeah. Oh, I feel like you just unwrapped like so many things for me. And it is something that you have also set out to do with your content. You, you communicated that in Gym Lounge, you were missing that opportunity, right? Of sharing and teaching others. And now you're doing it with your content. Where do you think this desire comes from? From passing on the knowledge and, and the learnings that you had, because, you know, like you might as well just do it for your company or like really close friends or the, all the portfolio companies you manage. I mean, I get benefit from it. I'm able to attract people who have, share my values on my team now. It's much easier for me to get people to work for me who share my values because they can go watch my content. Before it was like Alex was the only person that people really associated with the company. And there was this whole other world on the inside that nobody knew about. And so it led to a lot of mishires, right? And mismatches. So it benefits me in that way. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. I think that I set out to do it because I was like, I want to help people avoid a lot of the pain that I've incurred. And like, what is the point of incurring this pain if I cannot help somebody else avoid it? Feels like that's how you grow and make the world better. But then I think it, it was such a challenge for me that then it was like, you cannot give up because this is clearly something that's really hard for you. It was hard for me to show up on content It was hard for me when in the beginning, I got made fun of all the time and people would say really mean things and people would make videos and spread rumors about stuff, specifically about my voice and why is your voice so low, all these theories. And so a lot of it, it started as I want to help people. And then I think it got a secondary reinforcer, which was, I don't want to stop doing something just because other people make me feel ashamed. 
you know, and I got a lot of times where I felt ashamed. I would wake up and somebody I made, mean, I remember one, one morning I woke up and this guy made a YouTube video about me. And he was like, is Layla Marlozzi a tranny or on steroids? And I was like, either. What the hell? And I remember that moment. I was like, I hate me. Like, I literally was like, don't want to do this. Why? But and me, it's the, next, the next thing. I say these things, right? And I'm like, you know you're not going to stop. You can't. Because you made a promise to yourself. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's more important to me than any judgment or any criticism that I get. And so I think it turned into this journey for me because I think I realized, one, I'm not as good at making content as I thought I might be. You know, just because I've watched my husband do it for eight years doesn't mean I'm going to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. And the second was that it's benefited me a lot of ways. You know, it's like, I get to see all of these people creating better workplaces, like creating better mental environments for themselves and then creating better workplaces for everybody else. Yeah. And like, if there's one thing that I could leave people with by the end of my time in business, it would be how to be a great boss. Mm-hmm. Because like that changes it can change someone's entire life. It's like their spouse and their boss. It's like you have two entryways. Mm-hmm. It's like, that's why I talk about those things because those are like the two, the two people that have the most influence over your life. And when you have a boss, it's like you have all the skills in the world to be a great boss and you just choose not to. And that is crazy to me. But I think not everybody thinks that way. And so for me, if I can help spread that message and get that out to people, that means a lot to me because that makes everybody better. Not just business owners, but also the people that work for them. And then the second piece to it is like, again, you know, I recognize how it, it's actually very hard for me. And it was a skill that I was, I had a lot of skill deficits in terms of making content. I still do. And I said, like, I don't like giving up on things that are hard. Like, if it's hard, I want to lean in. I want to really master it. And I think what I've gotten from making content is I truly feel like, one, I can completely be myself. I don't have to be some filtered version that I think a lot of people do in making content because I just recognize, I was like, people are going to talk shit about me no matter what. They're going to talk shit and make up stuff that's not true no matter what. I fuck trying to like be cool or whatever, you know, which is like kind of how you feel in the beginning. You like feel like yeah. it's like be this thing. I don't know. And now I'm like, yeah, fuck that shit. That doesn't even work. So like I, it's given me a lot of freedom to just be authentic. And I think that does translate into what I do in my company, how I show up for other people too. Because it's given me the confidence that no matter what people say about me, I'll continue being myself and being who I want to be. That's so powerful. And I think you said that the price of growth or success is to be misunderstood, right? To be okay with being yeah. misunderstood. It sounds like the content game really kind of grow from that experience. and Totally. Unexpected. You know, I didn't know what it was going to be like to start making content. I'm sure you've felt that at times where you're like, I would not expect that people would think this about me. You're like, oh, I once had a, a short going viral, like my first short. And I was like, I'm oh, so excited. And then, oh, my goodness, uh, from, you know, your looks, your accent. Uh, I actually got a, I had a little birthmark here. I got it removed after. No, like, <laughs> because I was like, okay. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really triggering and it's very, very challenging. And the people that kind of write it, they actually don't care, right? So they, wow. for them, it's sitting out and going on with their day. So you said your your spouse and your boss are the major influences. And there's one piece of your story that I really love is when you said that Alex, I think on the, first, on the second date, unlocked something huge for you, which was you always wanted to help people. And that was clear for you, but you didn't know that you're allowed to also make a lot of money doing that. Yeah. And I would love if you could talk to me about how we often feel that something is a contradiction. And then again, kind of circling back to what are things people struggle to integrate that actually make a lot of sense together, but they feel like I can only have one or the other. Yeah. It's funny because I think that we've just created a lot of like polarization in society. And so... It's all of these ors rather than ands. And I like ands, not ors, because I think that I like being different and unique. And I found that the more that I lean into not making sense and being misunderstood, the happier I am. Because we have all these social norms that are put upon us when we grow up. And so we think we can't have this and that. But we can't. It's just that nobody else does, right? And so, you know, I think that my 
my comeback to somebody who says like, well, you know, I want to help people, but I don't want to make a lot of money is, well, wouldn't you help more people if you made some money? And I think some of that is due to ignorance of how to use money. Because here's the thing, people say at some point you have enough. And I'm like, I don't know if you know what you're saying. I think that you don't know how to use money. If you don't have the skill of spending money in a way that makes the world better, then it makes sense that you don't want more because you just, you just associate money with making yourself comfortable personally. Yeah. But my association with money is building something incredible, mm -hmm. right? Right now it's building this business. And I know that if I build this business, I can build something even bigger than this business next mm -hmm. because I will use the money from this business to do that. And so when I first met Alex and I told him, because he said like, how much money do you want to make? And I said, honestly, I just want to help people. Like that's really what I'm focused on. And he was like, well, what if you could make money too? And I thought about it a lot and I really thought, and I feel this even today, which is like, who's a better steward of money than somebody who doesn't even care about it? True. I don't, I'm not looking to hog all the money and, you know, use it for bad. I'm not using it to make the world worse. Like I want to use it to make the world better, to create less, you know, more stress for you, free work environments, to help businesses grow and strive and like, all these things, it's like, well, then maybe I can, maybe it's okay to want more money mm -hmm. to do good. And I think a lot of people also, like, I even have a hard time saying it now, but I, I will make myself, they even have a hard time saying like, no, I should do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, it would be good for me to do that. And I think, I just want to give people permission to say that because I think a lot of people, they have this icky feeling saying they want more money. Yeah. Why? You know, and by the way, if you want more money to live more comfortably, do whatever the fuck you want. You know what I mean? Like this mm -hmm. life is, it's what you make it, right? Yeah. But for me, it's like, I used to always associate people with a lot of money with people who were making the world worst. And, you know, I had that realization years in where I was like, well, what if I could use all of this money to make the world better? And so that's always what's driven me is I look at money as an approximation of the value I create. Mm -hmm. So the more money I make, the more value I've created. And then... If I can get more of it, I can use, I can trade my money for something that can then make the world even better. You know, it's like you can build hospitals and communities and like all these things. And so a lot of people say they want to help the world, but I don't think they understand what it takes to do that. Because if you're not using your money, whose are you using? Somebody else. What's the price for that? You know, so I've considered all of these things. So I've thought about it a lot and I just decided I was like, I, I trust myself with money. I think I'm a good steward of money. I think that I have a very healthy balance of like what I spend money on myself and then like stockpiling to make these dreams and this vision come true. And I think more people that want to help people would benefit themselves from admitting that, from practicing that, and from saying it. Because I think the world needs more people that are selfless trying to make money. But the thing is, they have this weird association with like money being bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I think that people often misjudge kind of the intention completely with it. And so because people are afraid that if I'm making money, I'm associated with the intention most people assume is behind it. I'd rather not make money because I don't want to be associated in that way. You know, I've, I also feel like uh, as you grow and if you've grown up like in certain environments, if you start making money, it is also a feeling that you start giving others. You might not want to give others about, you know, where you are right now or where they are right now. So I, I think we could do a whole <laughs> podcast on how, how we're done. Yeah. Did you do like any money mindset work or? No, you don't need a powerful your fucking mindset. You need to just go make money. Yeah. Like, I don't try to work on my mindset. I try to do something, which is like the best way to change your mindset is go make some money and use it for good. Yeah. And then you won't feel like shit. How do you actually differentiate that when you say, you know, the, or don't work on the mindset, um, but there's so much mindset kind of that goes into the things you do and how, how you approach them. Kind of, when is it BS mindset, which is basically mental masturbation, we don't have to get to work because we're consuming all this mindset content. And when is it useful, kind of practically in relevant? Well, I would say, why do we do all the mindset work? Because we want to do something. Mm -hmm. And we think that if we do all this work on our minds, that we're going to be more likely to do something that leads to an outcome we want. Mm -hmm. 
but we can do the thing that leads to the outcome without having thoughts that support it and without having feelings that support it. And so I have found it's much faster to change your thoughts by changing your behavior than it is to change your thoughts by changing your thoughts. Reason for it is because your brain uses evidence to formulate thoughts and feelings, right? Past experiences, evidence. And so if I go create that evidence, my mind is going to change a lot faster than if I try to manufacture it in my own thoughts. And so for me, I just think, I'm like, what's more efficient? Me just doing the thing. I don't need to believe it's going to work. I can completely, I have plenty of like limited beliefs. I just don't let them dictate my behavior. And so like, who's to say, you know, because to what degree does our mindset affect us, right? I can feel, and I have felt, I think a lot of people don't understand this, incredibly anxious, incredibly depressed, incre all these things. But if I still show up like somebody who's not, what? Eventually, I don't feel those things. And so at any time in my life when I have felt depressed and when I felt anxious, indulging in those feelings and acting as so has never helped me. You know, I say that as somebody who I would say that I've, uh, I have a deep relationship with anxiety <laughs> and I've developed one over my lifespan. And so I don't say this as a stranger to how these things can feel. I know how it can feel like you're going to die. Like it literally, you're just like, I feel like I'm going to die. Like I feel like mm -hmm. it's, I'm so terrified. I'm so uncomfortable. I can't function and I can still do the thing. And I just trust myself. And I know that now I'm like, I have been terrified and I have been felt almost paralyzed. And I've just been able to take that like one step in the direction I need to. And that step changes my whole life. A lot faster than going to therapy for six years. That is for sure. So kind of summarizing Lander from Mossy Formula to Growth is best hypothesis of what action we should be taking. We take the action, we make a quick recap, and then we take action again. Yeah, I think it's, if you exhibit winning behaviors, you will win. You don't need to feel like you're going to win. Okay. And you don't even need to think you're going to win. You just need to act like it. And eventually your mind will catch up. And I have just, listen, this is not worse for everybody. It's just what worked for me. It's like I have just found the slow guy up in the air and the slow guy in the air. Not very helpful all the time. <laughs> but getting to work and just like doing the hard thing, I can do that. And then this shit catches up. I love that. I think it's so helpful because it's so practical, right? And that what really creates the growth is, is the doing. I would love to ask you one more question before we wrap up. And that is, we have some parallels kind of in upbringing. And I'm also really close with my dad. He has helped me a lot on my growth journey and in business. I, I kind of wanted to shout him out. And I know that you have the same for your dad. I actually yeah. had to cry when you had your Father's Day post because I was like, oh, Aww. I relate to this so much and I think this is so beautiful. And you have described him on different occasions kind of as a, an anchor and as a mirror and that he has given you that perspective of wanting to be an anchor and a mirror for others. So how do you translate that also into practical action, being an anchor, being a mirror to empower others to grow? My dad's always said two things really well. He has listened intently, even when I know he didn't want to, and even to people I know he didn't want to listen to. And he has always made people feel heard, myself included. Mm -hmm. I think if there's any gift that he gave me, it's showing me the power of being a great listener. Because if you're a great listener, people want to talk to you and they want to tell you things. In my position, that's advantageous. Mm -hmm. And I also think that if you're a great listener, you can make people feel less alone. So that's the first thing that he taught me. I would say the second thing is that my dad did not punish me. He only told me what he thought I was capable of. Even in the moments where I was just like a complete shithead, my dad still didn't speak ill of me. You know, he always tried to gear, like just steer me in the right direction. Like, but you could do these things. And he never limited my perspective of what was possible for myself. He always told me that anything was possible for myself as long as I was willing to put in the work. And I think you repeat those things long enough to somebody, you start to believe them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think he taught me what, it, what you can do to make someone feel not alone, which I think has been something that I have 
you know, I, I survey my team. What do you think is my strength? People say, you're like one of the best listeners I've ever had. And so I think that I have the strength of listening. And I also think that I am encouraging. And I got both of those from him, you know, because when I look at my dad, I just think he's just somebody I admire so much. And like, I would do anything for my dad. Like, I just want to make him happy. You know what I mean? I just want him to have a good life. And he's such a good person. And uh, I just try to take what I can that I've learned from him and magnify it in a way, if that makes sense. Because I think having somebody who's reliable, who listens, who encourages you, who isn't unpredictable. Like, I think that's what makes a great leader. And I think in that way, he was my dad, he was a leader. And I took that as like, that's how I can be a great leader for my team. Thank you so much for sharing. Of course. Where can people keep growing with you other than uh, your podcast? Until I think it's uh, my, my personal favorite, <laughs> favorite uh, YouTube, um, anything else you would like to shout out? Honestly, just social media like at Layla Bormosi on Instagram, on YouTube. And my podcast is called Build. And the other platforms, I can't think of it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.